Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the um, to episode 14 of Women Scholars of Orthodox Christianity. Um, we're here today with uh, Dr. Lori Branch. I'm going to introduce her in just a second. Uh, before we get going, uh, I need to begin, as we always do, by thanking our generous donors at the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University for making this and everything else we do possible. I would invite all of you, uh, if, you're, if you're not familiar with the center, I would invite all of you to visit our webpage at fordham.edu slash orthodoxy. And from there, you can find uh, the many initiatives uh, we have, like this one. Uh, you can visit our YouTube page. Uh, we have a new series called uh, Orthodox Scholars Preach uh, on that page uh, that's uh, been doing very, very well, getting uh, a lot of positive traction and is a partnership with the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese in the United States. Um, the other thing to know before we get started is uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little Q&A um, button. Uh, Lori and I are going to have a conversation for about half an hour about her work, but as we go, please uh, ask your questions as you have them, and then uh, we'll, turn, we'll turn over to some audience questions and conversation and so forth. Um, okay, so our guest today is Dr. Lori Branch. Uh, she is an associate professor of restoration and 18th century English literature at the University of Iowa. Her first book, Rituals of Spontaneity, Sentiment and Secularism from Free Prayer to Wordsworth, was named the 2007 Book of the Year by the Conference of Christianity and Literature. She has published widely on literature, religion, and the post-secular. Um, from the 4th century sayings of the Desert Fathers to 17th century descent, contemporary Gothic novels, and Eastern Orthodoxy. She was a member of the Mellon Working Group on Religion and Literature at the University of Notre Dame, the results of which were published in the Journal of Religion and Literature. And prior to the pandemic, she lectured in Los Angeles, Boston, Provo, Beijing, Jiamin, and Shanghai about post-secular studies, Wordsworth, and the Bible. Um, she and her collaborator, Mark Knight, from Lancaster University in the UK, have co-taught two NEH, that's National Endowment for the Humanities, summer seminar for faculty on religion, secularism, and the novel. She edits the monograph series, Literature, Religion, and Post-Secular Studies for Ohio State University Press, and chairs the International Orthodox Theological Association's Orthodoxy and Literature Group, and is currently on uh, working on a book project entitled Post-Secular Reason. All right, that's a lot, and it's a lot for us to talk about. Um, so we're very excited about uh, having you with us today, Lori, and uh, hearing more about your work. You're the first literature scholar we've had on the series, and we need more of this. Um, uh, I'm increasingly just convinced that, uh, I, I'm a historian, so I didn't start there, but I'm increasingly <laughs> convinced that literature really is this gold mine for thinking about religion and religious attitudes and faith and 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 so forth. So um, why don't you tell us how you got um, interested um, in this kind of work? Like what what made you sort of decide one day to go to grad school and study English literature and 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 have a kind of religion and secularism angle to it? Sure, um, and I just I, I just want to say thank you for that kind introduction, and I'm so happy to be here with you too, talking about this. And um, I couldn't agree with you more about literature and uh, religion, spirituality, orthodoxy, especially. Um, you know, I'm from a family that's uh, real STEM heavy. My dad was a, um, a geotechnical engineer. I have doctors and mathematicians in my family. And when I actually when I went to college, I thought I would follow suit. You know, I was raised in a Protestant evangelical home. And if you were smart and you were, wanted to do things to the church, everybody just thought, you know, oh, well, you have to be like a medical missionary or something like you need to go into medicine. So coming out of that STEM background and the evangelical background, you know, I thought I was going to go to medical school and do mission work and stuff. And 
you know, it just, the, I, I have to say when I went to college, you know, the science wasn't as exciting as like talking about it with my dad, you know, yeah. I mean, there, I had huge, you know, pressing existential and spiritual kinds of questions. And so I, that led me to this long process over the course of my undergraduate career. And I ended up double majoring in history and English. And it was, you know, through a long process of that, that I, um, ended up as applying to graduate school in literature and kind of taking it from there. So I could, you know, answer the big questions, pursue the big questions um, okay. about meaning and yeah. Sure. And who, so who, who is like your first love, like not necessarily to read, but to study, like what, what, what figures were you really like, I got to know more. I've got to unpack this a little more. Yeah. You know, a, a huge uh, two figures that were really had a lot to do with what I, I would describe as my conversion to literary studies out of the sciences. I still love the sciences. I have a huge yeah. love of cosmology, especially in uh, astronomy. But um, uh, it was really T.S. Eliot and W.H. Auden were huge figures for me. I mean, I remember taking a world literature class when I was still a physics major <laughs> in college and I just having my mind blown by reading The Wasteland. Because I was like, this, this poetry is so dense and cryptic, and it's referring to every literature in the world. And it doesn't open up its meanings unless you figure out what questions to ask it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that was truly just such a revelation for me. So I went to graduate school thinking I was going to study the modernists. Um, by the time I had finished my master's degree, I, um, I was with Wordsworth. Um, and so really, I think you know, the, the, the grandfather of romanticism for England and all of, of continental Europe um, and, uh, and somebody who mediates a lot of the religious tradition of Western Christianity to the whole 19th century, to the Victorian era that comes after him as influential in uh, religious circles and uh, what we now think of as ecology um, and uh, yeah, the whole aesthetic sensibility of Western Europe. So, uh, yeah, by the time I started my PhD program, I was really, I had to move from the moderns to the romantics, uh, the modernists to the romantics. Yeah. And, and what made you, like, uh, if, if I understand this right, like, you do something with literature that most don't, right, <laughs> which is which is that you're really attuned, not just to religion, right, there have always been people who do religion and literature, but you're really attuned to that kind of uh, secularism as a kind of religion in literature, mm -hmm. right? And so, so when, like, did you sort of figure that out in grad school and were people like warning you, no, don't do that, nobody does that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a really great question. And I, I, yeah, I mean, I was, you know, uh, I was, as I was thinking about, you know, this interview and like, you know, I knew you were going to ask me to kind of explain how I got to where I am today. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about the in interesting intellectual trajectory of being really interested in religion and then ending up thinking hard about secularism. And then also on the more topical side, like it, being really interested in liturgy and ending up writing about spontaneity. And I think just that if you, you know, that, that kind of intellectual trajectory is not, I think probably as uncommon as it seems, you know, like, I mean, well, I was just naturally interested in religion. I mean, you know, I remember being in graduate school, reading Robinson Crusoe and being like, my gosh, this man's alone on an island for 27 years of the Bible. And all we're talking about is Marxism and capitalism <laughs> and stuff he's building. I mean, why are we doing this? You know, I'm mean, like, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about those other things, but it's just so yeah. clearly, you know, a, a lot of my response in graduate school was to notice what we were just, you know, completely deaf to hearing or talking about, you know, in, in an academic setting. And that seemed like such a deliberate, you know, excision of something. And so, yeah, so by being interested in religion, that made me think about what causes that in our, in critical theory, what causes that in, in academia more largely. And then even, and even in the literature I was studying itself, you know, all of those things kind of converged around the flip side of religion, which is the emergence of secularism and trying to get some critical traction on that. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I definitely want to talk about secularism um, because, uh, well, you, you have insights uh, and so forth, but uh, may, maybe as a segue into that, let, let's talk about your first book, right? I mean, not everybody's first book wins, award, wins an award, right? <laughs> um, so, I, I, I mean, obviously you've got something going on here. And, and so the book explores the concept of spontaneity, right, in English literature, and you kind of upend more general understandings 
of the development of religious identity and its relationship to secularism. So, so what drew you to this project, right? What is it about spontaneity in English literature and its relationship to, to the secular? Yeah, well, there are two real, um, I don't know, like pathways or streams that kind of flowed into this project. And one was on the one hand, it was that love of Wordsworth that I was talking about. You know, I, mm -hmm. um, I, I went to my, P going into my PhD program, I thought I want to write a single author dissertation. I mean, I just loved Wordsworth and everyone disabused me of that notion. They were like, you're never going to job. And so <laughs> you're going to have to broaden out what you do. And, um, and the other one was that I, um, I converted to Eastern Orthodoxy during my graduate study. So that was a process that began in um, my master's program. And I was received in the church at the, the, my first year in my PhD program. And, um, uh, and so going from an evangelical, a, a completely what we would say free prayer, spontaneous prayer kind of tradition into a liturgical tradition, you know, that was a huge part of my religious journey. I was uh, really searching for sacramental worship, for um, something that I, I mean, I could just tell that, that clearly what was going on in, in Hebrew worship was something that was liturgical, you know, and it, where, and the tradition I grew up in, like a lot of Protestants in America, you know, like, uh, it, we were told pretty directly, like, it's bad to write your prayers down. That's what Roman Catholics do. Yeah. You know, I mean, there was a real pro-spontaneity, anti-liturgical bent. And I think there really is, you know, like, uh, long, you know, broadly in, in American Protestantism. And so I was parsing through, like, where did that happen? How did that, how did, how did that come about? When did we start thinking that liturgy itself was a bad idea? And so that actually that poetic interest in Wordsworth and this interest in liturgy, you know, combined, like I, um, I was, I, I was trained in a really like new historicist style of scholarship. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, another like kind of wake up moment for me in graduate school was the moment when somebody told me, you know, the most published texts in the entire 18th century were sermons. And uh -huh. no one did anything with them. And I thought, I mean, like all kinds of lights went on for me. And I thought, I'm writing about some, I'm going to get into those, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. and figure something out, you know, and, um, and so um, at some point I thought, oh, I, I'm going to research this, um, the debate about liturgy and free prayer. And what I discovered in that was absolutely completely germane on the, that, what I discovered on the literary, cultural, historical side was completely, you know, uh, resonant with my own spiritual journey. And that was that you can really point to the point in English history where people start to argue, not just that they want to reform the liturgy of the church, of the, either the Catholic church or the Anglican church, which is mainly what happens in the 17th yeah. century, the Anglican church. Um, but you can point to the exact moment when they start to say, oh, we don't want to just reform it. Liturgy's bad. The prayer yeah. book is bad. Like we, we want to get away from that. And that moment happens in 1662. So it's two years after the restoration of the monarchy, after the Puritan interregnum. Um, uh, so they bring back uh, King Charles II. They bring back the bishops of the Church of England and to and an act to try to unify the country, what Charles and the bishops decide to do is to say that there's going to be a certain Sunday in which all the ministers, formerly Puritan, middle of the road, whatever they are, they're going to have to start using the Book of Common Prayer again. You have to conform to the Book of Common Prayer. And if you don't do that, you have to resign your position. And so there was a Sunday in yeah. 1662 in England where 2,000 um Protestant ministers left the pulpit and never went back to the established church. And so they became, you know, nonconformists and later dissenters. I mean, so we'll kind of use those terms in later 17th century kind of interchangeably. Um, but that literature, the, the liturgy free prayer debate that of all the, those sermons, pamphlets, um, was a huge part of my research for my PhD dissertation. And it helped me understand the cultural logic and rhetoric in which people first started to articulate spontaneity itself as a value. Like, yeah. why is this important? And in what way is it valuable? And then I could see the way that I could connect the dots between that um, profession of the importance of spontaneity all the way to Wordsworth saying very famously his definition of poetry, which is that all good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling recollected in tranquility. 
And so, uh, you know, it was enabling me to connect the dots across what we call the long 18th century from the restoration through romanticism, and then try to think about what happened to liturgy, but mainly spontaneity across the middle of the 18th century, what are its vicissitudes, its ups and downs. Yeah, so, uh, this is, the, as a historian, this is just so fascinating to me. But so connect it then to the secular, like to secularism, right? Where's the, right, what's the, what's the sort of, What's your intervention on religion and secularism in this context? Absolutely. Um, that it's, it's that it's exactly this. It's that I think when I got into those archives, I so I wasn't went to the Bodleian at Oxford and was going yeah. through all of those. I was approaching it with a very less Foucauldian, more Leotardian kind of um, attentiveness to discourse. Like what okay. kinds of language, what genres of discourse are these writers making the case for spontaneity in? And the thing that I found out was that they were always using scientific, empirical kind of rhetoric, like evidentiary kind of rhetoric and economic rhetoric. And so I'll give you an example, you know, like they would be, be saying that, you know, that a uh, spontaneous prayer, being able to pray freely from your heart without a script, without the crutch of liturgy, right, is yeah. evidence of grace, is evidence, it's like proof of God's working in your heart, proof of your conversion, right? So a, a real stress on this kind of evidentiary logic, and then that evidentiary logic is linked really closely with economic logic, both because conversion is completely imagined in an economic way, right, that Jesus pays the debt for your sin, um, that, you know, sin is mainly understood in a legal juridical kind of way, there's a debt that has to be paid, and the way that you know that you're kind of added to the contract of salvation, and they did literally imagine it as a contract in covenant theology in, the, um, in, in Puritan England and in New England, for that matter, um, that the, the proof of that is this enormous one-time overwhelming conversion experience. And conversion itself has that economic valence, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You converted from one um, uh, kind of, I don't know, currency to another, um, one side of the ledger book to the other. Um, and so I think that those logics, that the, the empirical logic that is really rising in the 17th century and this real predominance of a currency-oriented, exchange-oriented, you know, nascent capitalist kind of logic is a profoundly secularizing kind of rhetoric. And so yeah. what I think happens when uh, Protestant English theology takes up that logic and starts to articulate its own experience of salvation, of conversion, of prayer, of the worship of the church in those terms. In those, and that's what we mean by rhetoric, you know, um, and, and, and that kind of language. Um, but that, that's actually, it's almost like, I'll use a good uh, COVID era a metaphor you know it's like internalizing a virus that kind of comes in and changes the whole system right mm. and so a lot of my take on on western religion and i think it predates certainly um the liturgy free prayer controversy in the late 17th century in england um but i think that we see a lot of of cases from late scholasticism actually forward um where western christianity in particular i don't think that eastern christianity is immune to this but um, you know, where Western Christianity in particular takes in logics that are actually uh, and starts to articulate its theology in terms that are actually incompatible with the fundamental Christian understanding of what a human being is, of who God is, of how human beings and God relate to each other. And so, in the deepest level, that's what I mean by secularizing. But I mean, there are a lot of other, I mean, clearly, I, I know we're going to talk about this because it's a topic that interests you, but you know, what we mean by secularization is a different right. thing. And then what we mean by secularism as an ideology is, is something right, else. Again. Right, 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 right. So, uh, uh, okay. So, okay. So, so you're seeing at least what's going on in the context of 17th, 18th century Britain, you see as a kind of um, almost a profane importation that's, that's, that's distorting religion, right? It, it, it's bringing in the, these these rhetorics, these rationales, these ideologies. Uh, they're being adopted and deployed to define and explain religion, but they're changing religion in the process. Correct? Yeah, you said it really well. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. So, but, because 
one of the like you know like going off of a theorist like uh, and i'm sorry if i'm going to lose half of our viewers now but going <laughs> with, with a theorist like talal assad right um so like i read assad as saying that uh secularism is not some kind of foreign external anti-religious thing but that secularism is itself none other than an, uh, a, a natural or maybe not natural but an evolution of religion itself Absolutely. right it, I, I, when i want to say huge fan of talal assad yeah <laughs> I, I mean i absolutely love his work and now i think we can think of as his great trilogy you know genealogies of religion right and that where he's like making our historical concept of religion itself strange. Like when did we start to think religion as a category in the Western world and why, right? And then the formations of the secular where he really like, that's where he just comes out and says, secularism is an ideology that is part and parcel of modernity, just huge, like intellectual kind of revolution. And then the way I read the, the new third book, you know, Secular Translations, is that that's the closest thing we have to his post-secular kind of intervention where he's thinking yeah. about like what it is to live as a religious person and in, within secular logics in the Western yeah. world yeah. and yeah. how one has is constantly being called on to translate. And, and just so you know, he's, um, uh, he, Assad is really interested, you know, in this question of, of we would say liturgy, but of ritual and religious yes. practice yes. and how you Absolutely. take religious abilities and um actually he makes a lot of use of rituals of spontaneity and secular translations which just warm oh, that's great mind. he's one of my intellectual heroes and um yeah. oh and wow that's so flattering that, that's wonderful it's that yeah. overlap between that concern yeah. for um for for repetitious practice which is so much a part of of religious life and um and how that shapes the human being it's not just knowledge and ideas and facts that shape us right we engage in practices and behaviors like prayer, like uh, prostrations, like fasting, like almsgiving, right? And this shapes yeah, us as yeah, a person. Yeah. And so he's really interested in that and how we try to articulate the value of that in modernity and postmodernity. Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is this 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 is really great. Okay, let let's um, let's get a little less technical, um, okay. but 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 speak and speak a little more broadly, right? The 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 language I use is for parish consumption, right? Not not okay. not graduate seminar consumption, right? For parish okay. consumption, right? What do most people just get wrong about secularism? Oh, that's a great. That's a really great question. I love that. I mean, it's it. it this is actually still related to Assad, but I'll put yeah. it in total like <laughs> like plain game. Is that you know the biggest mistake that we make is to think that secularism is something that happens outside of religion. That secularism and religion are completely at odds. Secularism is birthed by Christianity in the West. Like you wouldn't have secularization and secularism without you know, just Christian culture and what it goes through and the ideas that it produces, the experiences it goes through in the 15th, 16th, 17th century. And so, um, yeah, that it, secularism is not just something that comes to religious people from the outside and opposes them, right? Um, it's actually kind of inside their operating systems too, right? Um, and and it's, it's not so much that secularism or, is against religion. I mean, I think that uh, if you ask like a person on the street, what but it's secular, so I don't know what they'd actually say, but it would be probably be something about like, well, it's kind of like anti-religious or something. But really, I mean, I think our best scholarship today, like Bill, the scholarship that builds on Assad and other similar thinkers and on Charles Taylor, tells us that what secularism is always doing is putting pressure on religion and defining good and bad versions of religion that are compatible with the modern nation state and the emergence of capitalism in the West, the furtherance of the aims of, of empire, colony, um, later industrialization, right? Um, and so, you know, bad religion doesn't go along with that agenda, that way of organizing society in the nation and that way of, especially like William Kavanaugh would point out to us, controlling violence, you know, appropriating mm -hmm. all legitimate violence to the nation state itself. And so, yeah. So secularism and religion, I mean, and I think that we have this kind of mistake about their intertwinedness happens both in terms of secular people and for religious people too. So it's not just religious people, I think, who misunderstand how the way that secularization or secularism and religion are two sides of the same coin, right? I mean, like, 
a, a sec, secular thinkers in the academy all the time, like, I think reflexively engage in modes of thinking where they think that their mode of inquiry doesn't have anything to do with faith or right. practice, right? right? That, and that's really, I couldn't be more wrong. And so, yeah. but, um, and we have lots of, I mean, it's not just religious scholars who are pointing that out. You know, I think like, and I feel a really wonderful essay on this is um, called uh, Uncritical Reading by Michael Warner at Yale. And, you know, and he talks about how, like what we all think of as critical reading, he calls it a, a particular kind of piety inculcated by intellectual <laughs> Oh, that's great. If we're going to keep doing that, we have to acknowledge what it is. Uh, and yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, so I think the big yeah. and, you, and you have to make your sacrifices to certain deities in in in, in <laughs> the guild, true. right? That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Which, which altars do you worship? I, I I'm a, of Apollo. You're of a Marx. I don't know. Who, yeah. You know. I mean, like, yeah, yeah. yeah we, we have our our own. Uh, deities <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 um okay so uh, again, again parish consumption um I, I mean that that was that was really helpful for you know was everybody get wrong about literature where does the scholar of literature in, intervene right I, I mean the historians are going to claim well they can all do it and and the scholars of religion are going to claim that they can all do it the, the theologians you know well, they think they can do it, but they need the historians. Uh, but but where where does where I, I know Telly's you know like screaming at me right now. Um, where, <laughs> what do uh, like tell me tell me where literature uh, in, in, in intervenes in this? Absolutely, you know, to my mind, um, George, that literature is the most like phenomenological kind of art form of like testifying to the whole experience the inward experience of being human to so to consciousness to our perception of our own consciousness of our relationships with other people right i mean it, it's, it's this really profound account of of human experience in the world and it, especially in its conscious and representational and aesthetic dimensions and um when we think about secularism, so how, where does literature like intersect with secularism? What I would say is that and Charles Taylor has a great model where he says, you know, like our our culture today, our secular age today, right, is really shaped by the the triple transcendence perspective, you know, like the total religionists on one hand and the the their full frontal denial on the other, right? I mean, just secularism versus a kind of hunkered down religion on the other hand. But he says you know, most people don't actually adhere to those two extreme positions. What they, most people occupy this huge field that opens up between those two extremes, which is nonetheless shaped by their opposition, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's think about that from a literary perspective. If literature is, you know, really this profound testimony to the real place where human beings live and the kinds of real paradoxes that we all live with about, about our gender, about goodness, about um, <laughs> you know, just yeah, we could go on and on and on yeah, there. Right, um, right, right, and right. Then right. what truth, um, value, right? Yes, Transcendence, yes. yeah. Yes, that um, so literature, I think, is profoundly uh, expert. I don't know what to say. It's it's eloquent. It waxes eloquent on that middle paradoxical place where human life especially in the Western world in a secular age actually unfolds and tells us all sorts of things about the way people negotiate, like what Taylor would call the cross pressures of modernity. You know, the cross pressures between secularization and religion and between uh, science and uh, e economics, all kinds of ideas like this. Like, the, how do we actually negotiate those out in real life? What are the tensions? What are the overlaps? What are the creative human ways that we live in that middle space between this artificial separation between religion, belief, practice, ritual on the one hand, and a supposed, you know, like, reason, knowledge, a calculative rationality, instrumental reason, um, capitalism, whatever, on the other. Like, how, how do we all actually live those things together in the middle space? And so I think, like, literature just gives us all kinds of human traction on the abiding religiousness mm -hmm. um, of, of human beings and our life in the world on the one hand, and also just some surprising truths about all the different forms that that takes and how it negotiates 
secular realities. And even in the case of like atheists and supposedly right. secular writers, you know, they're the, the great um, atheist critic and novelist, James Wood, um, you know, he says that um, that he, he feels like secular right literature writers and critics overlook all the time, you know, that um, what it means for secular writers to continually have recourse to religious language and religious mm -hmm. tropes. And he thinks that, you know, and so art for him and literature for him is a way of thinking about that. And um, yeah, I, you know, I can, I find with my students all the time that that's, that resonates with them. You know, when you start to push on categories that are kind of quasi-secular, quasi-religious, yeah. what does it mean to love mystery or detective fiction? And to really love that feeling of the, uh, the where the unknown brushes up against the known, right? Why, why do we keep replaying that kind of, you know, uh, in, engagement with mystery or mystery solving, you know, like that's just one example, mm -hmm. um, you know, that uh, our love of mystery, right, and of um, our engagement with other phenomena like uncertainty and hope, right, literature is just full of these things, and, um, and so it can just be a great place for us to think about our, our different religiosities, our different, what I always say to my students, the, the particular religiousness of this text, the particular secularity or religiousness of this writer, and then of themselves too, I can help them situate and understand that better. That, 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 was, that was really, uh, it, it was really eye-opening, I, I, I think. I, I like that response a lot. I, I mean, I guess I'm just curious, do you think that, you know, from the 17th century forward. I, I, I mean, obviously, you know, everything's produced in a context. There are questions of the age that e e even, you know, fiction writers are, are trying to engage. But do you think that um, it has changed, right? In other words, does the 21st century novel still speak to religion in the same way that the 19th century novel does? Um. And in some cases, it does it better, you know, okay. I mean, I, um, because I mean, in the 19th century, you know, a lot of our great novels are, are trying to, like, I think of the novels of George Eliot are kind of, they're narrating a decline or reworking or kind of domestication of religion in a way that are very, it's very much on the side of secularism. This is certainly not true of, of all novels in the yeah. 19th century. Not but, Dostoevsky, you know, for example. Right. George Eliot. Yeah. Right, right. I mean, yeah, yeah. Let's. I mean, we should talk great Russian novelists here in yeah. a minute. But um, uh, uh, and what's going on with orthodoxy and literature? But yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about Pulitzer Prize-winning writers like Marilyn Robinson and um, Cormac McCarthy, even who has a Catholic background, pretty agnostic. But I mean, just his literature loved by religious readers and yeah. really full of exploration of like where human hope comes from in the midst of. You know, tragedy and apocalypse and all kinds of things. So yeah, I mean, I think that um, uh, uh, it it does. Uh, it, contemporary literature does that. You know, I I I, um, I just so use Marilyn Robinson as an example. So Marilyn Robinson, author of Housekeeping, taught here at the Iowa, the famous Iowa Writers Workshop for many years. Um, she won the Pulitzer Prize for Gilead, and she's written three subsequent novels, kind of in the same uh, uh, fictional universe: Gilead, Home, Lila, and most recently mm -hmm. Jack. And um, I taught honor seminar on Marilyn Robinson's fiction. And so 16 students, we read Robinson all semester. And at the end of it, we invited her to class and she came. And it was just a fantastic experience for my students. And one of them, the first question they asked her was, do you feel like your, um, your the religiousness of your fiction is a barrier between your art and some of your, um, and your readers? And she had the shopping bag with her. And she said, well, you know, it's funny. I brought today with me like a package that just arrived at my doorstep yesterday. And it's the translation of Gilead into Farsi. And she <laughs> pulled out the book and she like looked at what a lovely cover it had. Like she goes, look, they, they've really gone to some effort to like portray a congregationalist Midwestern church, you know, in an accurate way on the cover and everything. And it's translated Farsi. And, and she started talking about all of the um, fan mail that she gets. I mean, literally from around the world of people yeah. from all different kinds of faith, you know, uh, Muslims, Jews, Catholics, you know, uh, Hindus, I mean, from all over the world, literally. And she said, it's not religion that's the barrier between us. It's, you know, it's, it's our, the American secularism 
makes a bigger barrier between us and the rest of the world. Oh, fascinating. And I just thought that was so profound. She, she said it a lot more eloquently than I just did. But yeah. with a visual yeah. aid of her novel, just translated into Farsi was, you know, just Oh, that's perfect. great. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's transition a, a little bit. And, and don't forget, if uh, people who are watching, if you have questions, uh, please uh, use the Q&A the Q button. So you, you obviously didn't start there. Um, you, you mentioned that you uh, converted to orthodoxy uh, in, in graduate school while you were doing your uh, while you were doing your work, but you have begun to write um, on on orthodoxy and literature. So tell us a little bit about about that. Um, I, I mean, I, I, I've read some of these articles. The one on uh, the one that sort of brings uh, the orthodox notion of metanoia, repentance, into conversation with um, scholarly critique. I thought that was fascinating. But uh, just tell me a little bit about this this kind of writing that you're doing now. Yeah, you know, I George, when you sent me those questions, I started thinking I was I was I just thought back about my publications. And I thought, you know, my very first publication in graduate school was a book chapter that was about um it was really about high theory. It was about Derrida and Leotard and Alexander Schmemann. And oh, I, wow. you know, and I, I was I was, yeah, I was thinking like, and, and I was just thinking, so I think I, I feel like I've always been writing about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Orthodox, you know, like, I mean, at least I, not like I'm writing about orthodoxy in my work, but, yeah. you know, for me, like a real watchword is integration. Like one mm -hmm. of the things that I learned in graduate school was this, uh, the academy is constantly asking me to segregate parts of my identity. And this yeah. is a bad idea. It's manifestly bad. <laughs> I decided that early on. And um, uh, and so I wanted to be thinking these thoughts all together. And so, you know, I was reading Derrida in graduate school and Leotard and thinking about um, and thinking about liturgy. Like, what is right about liturgy? Why do we reread the same lectionary every year in the church? Like, yeah. how that testifies to us about the fact that there's never one final meet reading of the gospel where you've sucked all the meaning out of it and now you've just got it you know like that's that mm -hmm. that perpetual rereading right is about the iterability of language it's it's endless fecundity and that's something that's of interest to these postmodern theorists like leotard and derrida and so and that yeah in that first essay i was thinking i i developed this idea of um of the benefit of the doubt and liturgical rereading, you know, um, yeah. what I want to call liturgical relation. Uh, and so that I think, you know, literature at its best, you know, we all, we say to our students in literature departments, one only ever rereads poetry. And this is really actually true of good fiction too. One only ever rereads it. I mean, because the, the first reading is not, you, you, you've just kind of gotten the lay of land at that right, point. Right, you know? right. so it, again, to like real, it's like that, that, T.S. Eliot example I mentioned earlier, right? I mean, you really have to come back to it with a lot of questions and from different angles to try to get it to the, the flower to blossom and to really start to give up its beauty mm -hmm. and its truth and to enable you to see it. So anyway, um, yeah, I guess I've just, so I feel like I've always been thinking those things together. Yes, uh, metanoia is a super important concept for me because um, I think that, you know, I'm working on a, a project called Post-Secular Reason and mm -hmm. where I want to try to give a good scholarly brief account of where we are with trying to define religion, trying to understand what secularism is, and how we could get out of that impasse to a more productive, what I want to say, a post-secular place. So that doesn't mean a return to religion in some backward-looking right. sense. It means breaking out of secularism as this assumption of this kind of deadlock and opposition between religion and secularism. And so, um, you know, I think that uh, metanoia, I mean, from a very, the, the very, the, the central glorious place that it occupies in our orthodox spiritual tradition, you know, I mean, I think of, um, like St. Simeon, the new theologian, who says, you know, it's through metanoia that a human being reacquires the splendor inherent to her. I, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm watching that quote, but, you yeah. know, we, we reacquire the splendor that God made us with through metanoia. Now, this idea of metanoia, I think, is really different than just, I think, what repentance has come to mean over the long course of some evolution yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and Western religion, right? where it has a privatized emotional content, yeah. mainly. Where and it's penitential. Yes, yes. It's, it's penitential. It's focused on sin. You know, that 
the, the, the metanoia that allows you to recover the splendor that for which yeah. God created you is not focused on sin. Right. That metanoia is focused on the love of God and the communion with the source of all being, the communion of the loving Trinity who made you. And it's, so it's that focus on love. It's that, that constant change of mind and heart. I think that is a, that, that does resonate with me about with what I learned in graduate school about critical yeah. thinking, right? Um, but it's, it's what it has that critical thinking does not have is this, this positive creative force. And so as I'm trying to, again, think in an integrated way and um, in a, in a intellectually, religiously, spiritually, holistic way, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I want to bring those concepts together and say that a rich concept of metanoia, which addresses the human being and all her fullness, has something to give to secular and relig secular and religious um, uh, community members in Western civilization, both because it changes the idea, it, it challenges the ideas about a human being and their, the human being's bifurcated nature and, and, and reason and all kinds of things um, and practice and, um, and what spiritual life, what spiritual practice is about. Um, I'm sorry, that was kind of wordy. And, uh, no, 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 I, no. I, 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 really, I really like this answer. And I really, I really like this idea. Um, you know, my colleague, Telly, who, who of course, you know, he, he's got this fabulous phrase that I, that I, I don't know, he came up with maybe 15 years ago, and I've been using it ever since. He refers to it as the asceticism of self-critique. Yeah. Oh, that's a lovely phrase. Right? I'll use that. Too. And, and, and it, at one in the same time, right, it just, uh, it, it just fits in with, like, it, it fits so well with just our, our tradition, right, our ascetic tradition. And it's not just about fasting, right? It's not just about prostrations, but it really is about self-inspection, right, um, and, 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 and self-transformation. But what he does with it, it, it sounds like what you're doing with it, it is you're, fold, you're, fold, you're both folding in even the whole scholarly apparatus and, and the, the scholarly thinking of critique, Right. And, and what that means. And, and so you're bridging and you're bringing those two things together. And uh, I, I, I just think it's genius. Uh, all right. One more thing. And, and then we, we've got some questions piling up. But one more thing I want to ask you about is we, we got to spend a lot of time together in Romania at the International Orthodox Theological Association. And you are the chair of the Orthodoxy and Literature um, component or whatever we call these division. So tell us about that. And, and then we'll go to the questions. One, I just want to say IOTA is so fabulous. And if listeners out there aren't involved in it yet, they need to be. I was just yes. <laughs> absolutely fantastic. That inaugural meeting in Yash was yeah. just terrific. And being with other scholars, being with uh, other Orthodox scholars uh, and sharing our ideas, our critique, our spiritual lives, being around other Orthodox women scholars there it was just, it was just so life-giving. And I really look forward to I'm, um, you know, participating in all the activities of IOTA going forward. Um, so we originally had just an orthodoxy and the arts group as part of IOTA. And, um, uh, and we had, I was one of the co-chairs of that. And then uh, it, through conversations and thinking about how the panels went there with, with uh, conversations with Paul Gavrilic as the head of IOTA, we decided that we really do need an orthodoxy and literature group. And so ever since then, so I am the chair of that group in uh, search of a co-chair. And so, you know, the way IOTA is organized is I need to find a co-chair from uh, a non-English speaking country. So I have been, we were, we're working on that. Um, I, somebody from Romania, Russia, Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia. I mean, we, I need to find someone who works, a Dostoevsky specialist in Russia would just yes. be fantastic, you know, um, but who can, you know, the common language of IOTA is English. So I do need to find someone there, but I, I appreciate you bringing up IOTA so I get to put that plug in. Um, yeah. 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 It was very exciting because I mean, one of the things that came out of the panels on um, about orthodoxy and the arts, especially the ones on orthodoxy and literature, I thought was this real sense of the pastoral gift that a real, con a rich consideration of orthodoxy and the arts, you know, iconography and music and literature really has to give the church. 
because so many people come to the faith through those avenues, you know, I mean, right. when I think about, you know, there's wonderful work done presenting orthodoxy in America, like you think through like orthodox, uh, ancient faith radio and all kinds of outlets, right? But, you know, in some level, like a lot of that is a, is a kind of like rush, rationalized apologetic presentation, you know, yeah. I mean, so, how many people have converted to orthodoxy because they read Dostoevsky? I exactly. mean, it's a lot. Yeah. It's huge. Yes. And yeah. honestly, yeah. I mean, I remember in graduate school, like I met like the the, the first year I had converted, like I met like the fifth or sixth person who said that Dostoevsky was involved in their conversion. And I like, I said, that's like, man, that's really, you know, you're like the fifth person I met who said that to me. And this woman said to me, oh yeah, we need an icon of the Russian novelists. Ah, <laughs> she was serious. Like she had, you know, like go, go Dostoevsky. I mean, she, um, uh, yeah. and you know, there's something to that. I mean, the presentation of the gospel, again, like, inside of its human fullness that you get there i mean it's just the novel and it, it, it's you know for me like i mean it, it's not it doesn't exhaust the form at all but really and just like all of its richness uh dostoevsky it's such a gift for us and um uh it, it's yeah anyway i'll stop there yeah, that's great yeah no we actually we have a a colleague of ours at fordham he runs the russian studies program and he's actually a descendant of tolstoy um, wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and wow. yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly right. Uh, and and he's and he's just fabulous. He 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 does a lot of work with the center and and so forth. Uh, Michael Sorgan and and you know since we mentioned Iota, we we should say we should mention the extraordinary work of our of our good friend Paul Gravilliak, who really you know worked miracles by pull, by pulling the whole thing off. Okay, let, let's turn to some questions. Okay, so the first question: Why the interest in secularism? as opposed to a wider lens on liberal thought from which both secularism and arguably modern literature through the novel are born? Wow, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, obviously secularism and liberalism, and by that we just mean, you know, the, uh, the component of what we mean, modern ideology in a broad sense focused on the autonomous individual, right? Whose, whose main concern is it's what, what Charles Taylor, its main aspect is its bufferedness, its autonomy, its liberty, right? Um, well, I guess the reason, you know, there, there is a lot of, uh, the scholarship that ends up thinking about liberalism in that way ends up thinking about politics and it's, mm -hmm. you know, like representations of the nation state and whatnot in literature. And there's plenty of good scholarship like that, especially about like our 19th century American writers, about Melville, about Hawthorne, about Whitman, about Dickinson, you know, like that, um, just think about the whole mythos of America as the city, you know, shining on a hill and all that. I mean, so I think that that critique of liberalism per se is important. But the idea of, you know, I, I do feel like that there is, that there's a need in academia for a, a real critical examination of the incipient, you know, secularism, like that, I mean, that, that condescends to religion, that brackets it off, that assumes, you know, that has assumed for a long time the secularization thesis, that modernity is going to progress and religion's just going to wither on the vine eventually, which has manifestly turned out not to be true in the, especially in the 21st century, but even in the latter 20th century. Um, so I think that, you know, I, it's, it, there's intellectual work that needs to be done that's uh, not only a critique of liberalism, which I mean is, is again, like totally well, <laughs> well founded, you know, but um, I, I'm really interested in the, the way that religion itself is bracketed by secularist kinds of thoughts, but it, you clearly can't be separated from liberalism either. I'm not okay. sure if that really answered the person. No, that, that's, that's good. All right, next question. As an Eastern Orthodox convert, how do you think Orthodox spirituality could better engage the secular seeker? Oh, uh, that's a great, um, <laughs> that's a really great question. And um, I would say, and so I, this is kind of coming out kind of a whole separate body of scholarship, like, you know, who are our, our nuns, our spiritual but not religious people, right? And I think that what's really important for cradle orthodox and convert orthodox to realize is that especially if you're like of my generation uh if you were converting uh pre 9-11 let's say um what you need to realize is that 
most of the people who convert to orthodoxy today are not going to convert for the same reasons that you did, like because they came to it from an evangelical Protestant background or from Roman Catholicism or from, from wherever, like there were doctrinal issues and like they were firmly grounded, right? So that there's this kind of investment already in like the status of scripture and the tradition, all of this, you know, no, <laughs> that the place where orthodoxy is going to meet um, people in the 21st century who, who can be thoroughly secularized, you know, I mean, like really just like have only the most vague idea of spirituality is going to be through spiritual experience. So, and what I mean by that is like by inviting them into, into worship, into the experience of our music, into the experience of iconography, into iconography painting sessions, uh, classes, into book groups about um, Dostoevsky, <laughs> about, about other writers. Um, you know, I think a great model for um, engaging secular people, um, actually I have a lot of his books up here and that's part of it as it happens, I'm looking at myself on Zoom, of uh, uh, Father Alexander Mann in the late Soviet mm -hmm. period, you know, who, um, was dealing with, you know, like thoroughly secularized people who were spiritual seekers, you know, and just, and coming to them with the, the, the full richness of the Orthodox spiritual tradition, fully not whittled down, not oversimplified at all, but with a different kind of interface for them. Um, reading, um, the great Orthodox spiritual thinkers, the literary writers, the science of his day. And of course, Father Alexander had a wonderful scientific education as the, uh, in college. And um, uh, he, he was just able to mediate the tradition to people by inviting them in to the life of prayer. So, I mean, I think a lot of times like we may think in the West that like that, that doctrine and theology and a lot of things come first, and then you're going to get to some repentance, and then you're going to get to prayer and things like this. I really do. Th I think that in the in we need we need to kind of flip that somehow to have our churches be places that are open, places of quiet, of peace, of conversation, of engagement with people where they're at, um, and then from that experience of of peace and through people real, you know, interface with Orthodox Christians who really are like radiant and have been integrated through their spiritual encounter with the triune God somehow. That is first, that experiential encounter with the faith, I think has to be first. And then the rest of it, then, then you go deeper into the tradition that I just don't think it's the, the, the typical doctrinal path that a lot of us in the latter 20th century took into the faith. It's going to be very different for people in the 21st century. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right about that. Uh, that. That was a great answer. Okay, next next question. Uh, I've read many authors who illustrate profound spiritual insight without the label of Christian or Orthodox Christian. Mm -hmm. Herman Hess, P.D. James, Yann Martell. Would you comment on any of these authors? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, uh, or, or maybe another one like them. That, that yes, yeah, that's what I was going to try to think of, like, what yeah. can I, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, like, the, the, the spiritual, um, I'm thinking of the, the, I'm teaching a class right now, I'm just going to, I'll go through some other writers, and uh, that, that seem to speak to me about, about this, like, the, their spirituality not being, not labeled as Christian, and I think that that's enormously important, and I don't think we should be afraid of talking about spirituality in literature as though that's some, I don't know, like suspectly new agey kind of term, you know, I mean, because it testifies to like something deeply and truly human that abides even when a person thinks of themselves as secular or as non-religious. And so we should just embrace that term. It is fine to think about the spirituality of all kinds of writers. Um, yeah, I'm right now I'm teaching The Road by Cormac McCarthy. And so, I mean, somebody obviously informed by the Christian tradition, but really wrestling with it, you know, uh, very skeptical of it, angry at God in some ways. Um, and yet, you know, the real, the spirituality of that novel, which is much love, and it's really kind of become a touchstone text in literature and religion studies, right? It's about the, the love of the, the father and the son, the father and the son in that in that novel right and we're the we're the man's hope in the in a completely hopeless kind of world you know what enables him to to go on with the boy to say to the boy you know like 
we carry the fire, we're going forward, right? You know, and for him to say, you know, even with his dying breath, you know, goodness will find the boy, it always has, you know, I mean, like, there's this, so this is an exploration of hope, and of the human heart and that, and um, I do have a unit in that class, it's about mystery and detective fiction, and so we read Sherlock Holmes, and G.K. Chesterton, and especially Dorothy Sayers, you know, Dorothy Sayers, just a master um, of, like, thinking about, like, that post-World War One English culture and life, and, you know, how spirituality is, um, it's, a, it's an undercurrent, you know, like there's, she, she gives you all kinds of hints on the surface of the fiction. Lord Peter Whimsey's de- collecting folios of Dante and, uh, and uh, uh, Parker, the detective he works with, is reading commentaries on the Galatians. And they, you know, but they're, th- yeah. these things are, there's just enough hint there to show you that these other issues that are being thought about with like uh, class politics and, and, and good and evil and morality are, you know, right. Are, are, um, but these are all intertwined. And um, yeah. Uh, and I already mentioned James Wood, a novelist that I'm really quite fond of, he, you know, very famously rejected his, he's English. He rejected his evangelical Anglican like, upbringing, but his writing is so spiritual. You know, even his, it's this fantastic novel called The Book Against God about this pathological liar named Thomas who's like writing this book called The Book Against God. It's just, that novel is hilarious. And it's such a deep exploration, you know, from an atheist and pretty secular perspective of like what it means to to lack like the hope to bring a child into the world, for instance. That's one of the subplots of the novel. And so, I I mean, I just, uh, yeah, I'm I'm very, I don't don't know what to say else in response to that question other than to say, you know, that, those kinds of issues are, are, are in literature everywhere, and it's wonderful to recognize them and to have conversations with other people about them. I mean, we just, we deepen our humanity by doing that. Okay, so, so we're basically out of time, but let me just ask you, you, you mentioned it very briefly, but tell us a little bit more about the book you're working on now. Sure. So I'm working, I hope, yeah, I don't know, George, you light a candle for me, say, (laughs) I'm trying desperately to finish this book. Um, You know, I spent the last like uh, 10, 14 years, you know, uh, raising my kids and homeschooling them a lot of the time and, uh, and we're making slow progress on this book. And um, so post-secular reason is a book where, yeah, as I narrate it to you, it's a kind of four chapter project. It's trying to be like in dialogue with some of the major, like it's trying to bring together a lot of our important, um, uh, my, my phone is bothering me here on the internet. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, I'm on my laptop. Um, you know, to, without becoming like a doorstop kind of book, like the wonderful, like Eugene McCarriher's um, Enchantments of Mammon or Charles Taylor's The Secular Age, like trying to really like parse out with literary examples that make it accessible and that can speak across a lot of disciplines, where we are in our scholarly thinking about what happened to religion and modernity, what secularism is, and then what are our intellectual premises for thinking outside those binaries, that opposition, and then what it would look like, why we should want to live differently to, to go beyond that. And that's where actually in that, the final chapter is really organized around ideas of like secular metanoia and, and religious metanoia. I mean, like rethinking our idea of what it is to be a human being, what is reason, what is knowledge, if we get past this uh, religious secular binary and a lot of the intractable problems that it mires us in. So that's what I'm uh, working on in that book. That Short sounds wonderful. Um, okay, so um, thank you, thank you so much. I want I want to wish you and everyone who's watching, and we'll see it on YouTube and so forth. Uh, uh, you know, the Orthodox calendar is very late this year. Uh, I want to wish everybody a good Holy Week next week, um, and and Pascha and and so forth. And we will be back with uh, with yet another installment of this um, uh, late later in May. So um, thank you, uh, Dr. Branch, Lori. Uh, th- th- this is a lot of time, a lot of fun spending some time with you, and uh, we'll see oh, you likewise. soon. Likewise, my pleasure. Okay. Take care. Take care, everybody. Bye.